Could we be facing crypto contagion? That's been one of the biggest fears following the collapse of FTX. Fears around who was most exposed and whether this could lead to a chain reaction of cascading liquidations and insolvencies. Most recently, those fears have centered around Genesis, the largest crypto prime broker and one of the crown jewels of the DCG conglomerate. Today, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about Genesis and DCG and what a failure of one, or both, could mean for crypto. This is a video you don't want to miss. Before we can take a look at exactly what's been going on, we need a bit of background on Genesis, DCG, Grayscale, etc. etc. So firstly, let's start with DCG, or Digital Currency Group. Now this is a crypto institution that's been around since 2015. It was founded and is run by Barry Silbert, a stalwart of the crypto space. Now DCG has invested in a large number of crypto companies. These include the likes of Blockstream, Chainalysis, Circle, Coinbase, Dapper Labs, Dune Analytics, Etherscan, Fireblocks, Ledger, Parity, the list is long. But perhaps the most important businesses that DCG controls are its wholly owned subsidiaries, the biggest two of which are Grayscale and Genesis. Let's call them the G unit, with a tip of the hat to Arthur Hayes. First up, the aforementioned Genesis, one of the largest prime brokers in crypto. Now, a prime broker provides a number of services to institutions, including the following custody of assets, over the counter trading, and extending credit. Now, the concept of prime brokerage has long been a feature of TradFi, but Genesis has, of course, built up a name for itself in the crypto market. In fact, back in 2013, Genesis launched the first Bitcoin OTC trading desk and since then has grown to facilitate hundreds of billions in transactions. Here's an overview of its 2021 market activity. Not small numbers by any stretch of the imagination. OK, so that's Genesis. Grayscale is perhaps much more well known. Formerly known as Grayscale Investments, it's a digital currency asset management company that was founded in 2013, again by Barry Silbert, and launched its pioneering Bitcoin trust that same year. Now, this serves as a private placement for institutions and high net worth individuals. For those unfamiliar, trusts are regulated investment vehicles that issue shares to their investors. For many years, Grayscale's Bitcoin trust was pretty much the only way that large institutional investors could get exposure to Bitcoin in a compliant manner. As such, the net asset value of the trust shares would always trade at a premium to the value of the underlying Bitcoin. However, this has devolved into a deep, deep discount for reasons that I'll get into later. Anyways, Grayscale has a number of trusts, but its GBTC Bitcoin trust is the biggest and it holds over 650,000 Bitcoin to back up the shares it has issued to investors. So now that we have a bit of a rough overview of these two pillars of the DCG empire, let's take a closer look at how things got to where they are. Our story begins way, way back in May of this year. Yes, it has been a long year, hasn't it? May, of course, saw the collapse of Terra and the plunging values of its lunar coin and UST stablecoin. Billions upon billions in value evaporated in a matter of days, leaving thousands of retail investors holding the bag. However, it wasn't only retail investors who got hit. Large institutional funds and hedge funds also got caught up in the unwind. One of those most badly affected was Three Arrows Capital, or 3AC. Now, it's hard to tell exactly how much they lost, but by some estimates, it could have been over $500 million. This led to a massive fall in the net asset value of the fund. The only chance they had to plug that hole was a recovery in the crypto markets. Of course, as we saw, this never happened because only a month after Terra, 3AC imploded in one of the biggest crypto blowups thus far. What we later learned was that 3AC had a lot of creditors and had borrowed 
billions of dollars. This was from the likes of Voyager, Blockchain.com, and of course, Genesis Trading. In the case of Genesis, these loans totaled $2.36 billion. While collateral was posted for some of these loans, the collateral was not enough to make up for the shortfall that was owed by 3AC. Not only that, but part of the contagion caused by 3AC also meant that Babel Finance, a Hong Kong-based crypto lender, was also left facing solvency issues. Babel had borrowed funds from Genesis as well. The result was that Genesis's parent company, DCG, had to step in and assume at least $1.1 billion of 3AC's debt on behalf of Genesis. We later learned that this was in the form of a promissory note from DCG to Genesis. More about that in a bit. In the end, the 3AC and Babel Finance cluster ended up costing Genesis, quote, hundreds of millions, and it led to Genesis's CEO having to resign. Now, there's an interesting canard here, and it's something that seemed to come to light after this whole debacle. And that's how intertwined 3AC was with Genesis when it came to exploiting the GBTC premium. I'll leave a link to this blog post over here, which lays out some amazing coincidences between these firms and the lending 3AC engaged in. The TLDR is that 3AC borrowed BTC from Genesis, which then locked this BTC into Grayscale for 3AC to issue GBTC. This was at a time when GBTC shares were trading at a premium. These shares were then used as collateral for a loan from Genesis for USD. The USD was then used to go and buy any amount of illiquid shitcoins. Now, this trade was all well and good when GBTC was trading at a premium, but things took a turn for the worse when it became a discount. As things worsened, it further damaged the 3AC trade and hence further hammered their already wobbly position. It's no wonder that 3AC was pitching the GBTC discount reversal trade so passionately right up until the time of its collapse. Something else I should note as well is that DCG also tried to prop up the price of GBTC shares over the past year as the discount widened. For example, according to filings, they bought 15 million shares between March of last year, the date they first went into discount, and January of this year. We'll come back to the DCG grayscale position in a sec. First, though, back to Genesis. After the 3AC collapse, Genesis appeared to be weathering the storm. Despite the fact that crypto lenders and funds were dropping like flies, they managed to keep the ship steady, or so it appeared. That's until the entire crypto world was rocked by the collapse of FTX just a few weeks ago. There were many institutions, investors, users, and lenders that either had funds locked on the exchange, had invested in FTX, or had collateral exposure. One of the lenders that came out and said that it had no exposure to FTX was Genesis. Except that wasn't really true, because a day after the initial disclosure, they said they had a small $7 million loss from hedging. Don't you just hate it when that happens? Well, turns out that wasn't really true either, because the day after that, Genesis said its derivatives business had $175 million stuck on FTX. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Things did indeed escalate quickly. Of course, the real damage came by way of the liquidity crunch that happened in the wake of the FTX collapse. Lenders were rushing to recall loans, and those that had their funds on centralized platforms such as Gemini's Earn were also rushing to withdraw. This was even more problematic for Genesis, as it was Gemini's lending partner. That's because these were short-term loans that Genesis had to honor. Also, given that Genesis lends out funds to other institutions with longer loan terms, this meant that there was a mismatch between the duration of the debts. The result? A liquidity mismatch that placed Genesis in a really precarious position. It was so precarious, in fact, that Genesis began seeking $1 billion of emergency funding. This funding was required by 10 a.m. on Monday the 10th of November. However, as we all now know, that funding never materialized. Biggest surprise ever. And Genesis had to freeze its withdrawals. This announcement further added to the pressure on the retail side 
as users were rushing to withdraw their funds from Gemini Earn. Genesis was desperately looking for cash, and according to reports in the Wall Street Journal, it approached Binance and Apollo Global Management, a large private equity firm, in order to sell its loan book. Again, the answer was thanks, but no thanks. But despite these issues, Genesis dismissed concerns that it could be heading into bankruptcy, saying, quote, We have no plans to file bankruptcy imminently. Our goal is to resolve the current situation consensually without the need for any bankruptcy filing. Genesis continues to have constructive conversations with creditors. Of course, we've heard that one before. And as the rumors continued to swirl, they also started to engulf its parent company, DCG. That's because if the hole in Genesis's balance sheet was too large and it couldn't raise the required funding, then there were concerns that this could have an impact on DCG. Remember, DCG assumed some of Genesis's liabilities and there was speculation that it had engaged in other forms of lending with the broker. For what seemed like an eternity, Barry Silbert was incredibly quiet. This led many people to wonder how bad the issues at Genesis and DCG really were. However, last Tuesday, Barry finally broke his silence to assuage fears over the companies. This was in a letter to shareholders which explained exactly where Genesis and DCG sat. Whether this really did calm the markets is up for debate. That's because the letter contained a number of troubling revelations. Firstly, Barry noted that Genesis had hired Molis and Company, a global restructuring firm. Now, this isn't really a good thing because restructuring isn't something that healthy companies do. But that's still only a Genesis problem. What's more concerning than that is the disclosure of the borrowing that DCG itself had been undertaking, a great deal of it from Genesis. For example, DCG owes on aggregate a little over $2 billion. $1.6 billion of that is to Genesis, and the rest is to external creditors. The $1.6 billion from Genesis included that $1.1 billion promissory note that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is important because it impacts on the financial accounting of Genesis's balance sheet and perhaps explains why it hasn't been able to raise. According to Bloomberg, Genesis Global has $2.8 billion in outstanding loans. These are viewed as liabilities on the balance sheet of Genesis. The loan and promissory note that DCG has taken out from Genesis are the assets on its balance sheet. Therefore, the rest must comprise some other real assets. But these loans from DCG are only valuable in that they're going to be paid back. One has to wonder whether they'll be able to meet them when they're due. The $575 million loan is due in May of next year, and the $1.1 billion promissory note is due in June. If DCG defaults on them, then Genesis will have a $1.6 billion hole. Creditors would only be able to get about 40 cents on the dollar. Now, this would be one thing if Genesis was a standalone entity, but because of that promissory note to DCG, it means that these creditors have recourse against DCG for the $1.1 billion. This means that DCG will have to raise enough cash should these creditors come for them. This on top of the $575 million that is due to Genesis in May. So, can DCG raise the cash? Well, it won't be easy. Firstly, Given the debt that's already on DCG's balance sheet, it could be very difficult, if near impossible, to raise any more of it. So the only route open to DCG could be an equity raise. The question is, what sort of valuation could it really get in these market conditions? Now, for this analysis, I'm going to lean on this blog post over here by DGEN Trading, linked to below as well. So, at crypto's peak last year in November, DCG was able to raise at a $10 billion valuation. Based on estimates from the author, Grayscale was probably doing revenues of $1.1 billion. Earnings on this are likely to be close to revenues, as it's merely just a management company, i.e. high margin business. Then, on top of this, Genesis was thought to have had $1 billion in earnings last year. So, Total earnings that DCG could have generated last year 
were at least $2.1 billion. If we were to put these two together, it means that the price to earnings or P to E ratio is five times. This also excludes all the earnings that were coming from DCG's other ventures like Coindesk, Foundry, and all their other investments. If we were to include these in the calculation, then the PE could have been even lower. And remember, this was an earnings multiple at literally the top of the bull market. OK, so what could Genesis command on the open market right now? Well, firstly, I think it's safe to say that Genesis won't be bringing in any bacon this year. So there are no earnings coming from that subsidiary. When it comes to Grayscale, the analyst estimates earnings of about $279 million. So we can therefore assume that these can roughly serve as the earnings component for DCG as well. When it comes to the multiple itself, we definitely can't expect a ratio of five times. For institutional investors and investment managers, crypto is not a sector they're beating down the door of right now. Let's assume a PE ratio of only two times. That would imply a valuation of only about $560 million. Even if the numbers were off on the earnings or multiple side, it's a long way from being able to service the $2 billion or so of debt. So, what does this mean? Well, DCG will have to sell some of its assets in order to meet a shortfall. Now, one of the assets on DCG's balance sheet is almost 67 million shares in GBTC. As I mentioned earlier, DCG has been purchasing these ever since March of last year to help alleviate the discount. That means there is a lot of untapped value over here. The only problem is, given that GBTC is trading at such a discount, the amount that can be realized from selling the shares on the open market is a lot less than could be generated if they were redeemed for the underlying Bitcoin. For example, at a price of $9.2 per GBTC, that implies that the value of DCG's stack is about $618 million. If DCG were to dump this on the market, it would further widen the discount and destroy the investment case for GBTC. Moreover, it still wouldn't be able to raise close to the required amount to meet the financing required for the incoming debt. That said, the value of the collateral that sits behind DCG's GBTC stack is at least $1 billion, assuming the 40% discount. Therefore, if they were to get access to that Bitcoin, they could raise a substantial amount of collateral that could be used to meet some of their obligations. The only problem is that this redemption cannot be done right now. Those funds cannot be unlocked. There are only two ways in which this could happen. One is what is termed a, quote, Reg M relief or Regulation M relief. I won't go into the specifics here, but we'll leave a link to this tweet thread by Masari CEO Ryan Selkis. The TLDR is that this would allow GBTC holders to potentially redeem their shares for the underlying Bitcoin. It would help DCG to redeem its massive stack and could even allow the pricing of GBTC shares to properly reflect their underlying intrinsic value. However, there is one small issue with this, and that's that the SEC has to approve a Reg M exemption for Grayscale. Given how reluctant they've been to approve a spot ETF, I somehow doubt that Grayscale will get lucky here. This means that one of the final options left on the table is to potentially unwind GBTC. This would basically mean that the trust would liquidate its Bitcoin holdings and use the proceeds to pay out the holders of GBTC. There's only one problem with this, and that's that Grayscale holds 650,000 Bitcoin. Of course, I don't need to tell you the impact that this could have should it hit the open market. There's no way that this Bitcoin is sold without having a severe, and I mean severe, impact on price. According to that aforementioned blog post, the author reckons that the market impact of those sales could see Bitcoin breach 8K. Assuming an average sale price of 12K, this would mean that DCG would only be able to raise about $750 million, still not enough to really plug its hole, but better than the scenario where it will have to sell its GBTC shares. However, it will have massive implications for the rest of the market. The hope now 
is that DCG and Grayscale can avoid this scenario because if they can't, then crypto could see a lot more pain before this already dreadful year is out. OK, time for a few closing thoughts. Contagion is a word that's being used a lot in crypto these days. While quite often it's nothing but dubious speculation, sometimes it's a real risk that people can discount too easily. Indeed, many will point to the collapse of Terra back in May as the first domino that set off a chain reaction. 3AC's exposure to Luna and UST meant that it had to default on its loans, including the billions that it had taken out to fund its GBTC arbitrage trade. Of course, this destroyed Genesis's balance sheet to the point where it still has not been able to recover. The FTX collapse, caused in part by the broader deleveraging, was the straw that broke the camel's back over at Genesis. It's also pretty crazy to think that what set off the FTX collapse was a leaked balance sheet in a Coindesk article, itself a wholly owned subsidiary of DCG. This leak has now come full circle, and the FTX shitshow has engulfed Genesis and, by extension, DCG. Now, where we go from here is uncertain. There are reports that Genesis has even dropped the amount it's looking to raise to only $500 million. I somehow doubt that it will be able to find willing buyers or creditors. It's more likely that the firm will have to turn to those restructuring advisors at Molis & Co. A fire sale or bankruptcy could be the only options left. Now, how this will impact DCG is anybody's guess. The behemoth has certainly seen better days, and its balance sheet is looking decidedly the worse for wear. One can only hope that it will be able to raise the required capital without having to sell GBTC or unwind the trust. The latter could have a cataclysmic impact on the market, one that could drive cascading liquidations into overdrive and destroy many other crypto businesses, funds, and hodlers along the way. I, for one, am praying to Satoshi that it doesn't happen because it's the last thing that we need to end a year that's gone on quite long enough already. And that's it for my video today, folks. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. Also, if you're looking for some of the best promos and discounts in the crypto space, then my deals page is where you should go, exclusively for the viewers of this channel. All of that is linked to below. That's it for now, my crypto crew, but I will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.